Okay, this vid is going to be about old versus new technology in shotguns. It's not going to be comprehensive or, or exhaustive or even useful, most likely. This is mostly notes to myself and what I've learned that was an interesting thing I noticed today. So we'll go for the idea of what a 12 gauge is. We're doing the 12 gauge as an example because it's the easiest one to look up, not because it's the only one. Back in the before time when first shotguns existed, granddaddy shotgun, the bore diameter for 12 gauge, if you're not aware of it, is based on taking a pound of lead, dividing it to 12 equal parts somehow, getting the mass exactly right, and then making a round ball out of a piece of lead. Now this varies by the metals that are in it, by contamination or on choice. This also may depend on whether it's hard cast or soft, according to some people on the net. I don't really think so. But it works out to almost 73 caliber, 72.9 caliber or 0.729 inches. Now, we're going to be doing totally not equal equipment here, but we're going to start off with the idea of using a gun with forcing cones made for black powder, gunpowder, using fiber wads, and it being made by a simple method of starting off with a piece of metal pipe that could be welded or it could be extruded or whatever, uh, drawn over mandrel, uh, for instance, and it's made for it having an inner diameter that matches the bore diameter, number one. Number two, I'm going to presume at this point that the, the chamber was drilled, doesn't have to be, with an ordinary drill bit, like by today's standard, a boring bit or a reaming bit, to be the correct diameter with a specific taper to it. Now, if you're not aware of this in a shotgun, that means it starts out at 0.81 inches approximately and then tapers down to 0.79 or 78 or something like that. Now, the exact numbers I'm going to quote below are too standard, but if you measure any gun anywhere, it's not going to match these necessarily. It should be pointed out that Schedule 40, three quarter inch pipe, is pretty close to matching the chamber diameter, but is not the bore diameter of a shotgun. Now, you might be wondering, why would they have a diameter change? Wouldn't that make it more difficult? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a couple of ideas here that may explain this. But again, you start off with one bore diameter. And then you drill it out using a, let's say, a 13 16 drill. That's pretty close to 0.81 inches. Now, the actual shell, shell tapering is then accomplished by then reaming it, usually with a piece of square metal bar stock that's been tapered. Very, very specifically, it's easier to make that and then hardened by heating it up in a fire, and it has the effect of, of milling the metal a little bit, or just mooshing it out of the way, because it might be soft steel. And then you can harden the barrel or whatever, or do whatever metal treatment you want to, and you have a gun barrel that works. But in that case, you may see on the upper left-hand corner, it's a rather abrupt stop. Now, the reason for that is, at the time, these were paper cartridges, and they also had brass, you know, full brass, but they started off with the idea of using a, uh, a cartridge, if you wanted to call it at that time, that was basically a package of lead balls or maybe a single slug, a little separator, some powder, and you just jam the whole thing in there and set it off like a freaking cannon almost, only breech loading. The idea was to make a package that was open on the end, at least partially, or could be, and it would do the same thing. And that's how the shotgun shell started. Now, I'm oversimplifying it and getting it wrong on purpose, but for purpose of discussion, this is good enough. The fiber wad that was used is literally, well, you have to look up what the fiber wad looks like. The tube that this was all placed in, and that's a good word for it, was a paper hole, sometimes waxed paper, but not always. And it had to taper. They would wrap it around a dowel that could be straight or it could be tapered itself. And the outside of it had to taper slightly, so you got that 0.81 down to 0.79 or 0.8 inch neck diameter. And... That created a specific tapering rate, and it's listed as five thousandths of an inch per inch of length in the chamber. Now, that's for shot shell length, and if you did that from 0.812 inch at the base of the shell down to 0.798 for the inch for the neck diameter, you'd end up with a chamber length, if you did it by the books, at five thousandths per inch of 2.8 inches, almost exactly a three inch chamber. You may have noticed a shit ton of shotguns are three inches, or two and three quarter rated, but they'll tolerate all sorts of things. But anyway, if you're not aware of it, it would have an abrupt end right here. Now that's the fired length. It could be as short as this, and then open up to there. The idea is that once it came there, the transition from the diameter inside of the shell should be a short jump, and it should be 
you might have noticed I, it's overemphasized here, the wad column, or wad, would act as a spacer in here so that the pressure would never release before it got the pellets into the barrel. You might get a pellet stuck here if it's birdshot, but most likely you get everything out of the barrel. The idea here is that the, the uh, paper hole was thick enough that you had to have a bigger chamber in order for this to work. Now let's fast forward to today. Modern shotgun shells have a thin wall, very thin. It's overemphasized here, but that's not much of an overemphasis. And they use plastic holes that will conform to whatever they're hitting. But if they hit this really sudden transition done with, let's say, a drill bit, you end up with it kind of acting like a bore obstruction. It creates an increase in pressure, and it creates not just recoil, as people perceive it, but it also causes a pressure difference between the barrel of the gun and the action that's pressed up against it to put the shell in. It can cause the thing to loosen up over time or just damage it. The thin plastic hull, however, if you put it into a gun that was the same diameter all the way through it, it would produce a fairly good result. You'd get most of the pressure not bypassing it and going through. Let's look at the more modern one over here. Obturation versus obstruction for the bore. In this one, it has a longer forcing cone where it's been milled out and molded out. It might be pseudospherical or elliptical. And it pushes in here and it squeezes the conforming plastic from this edge to a little jump where it pops into this space here. And then it starts squeezing it through. There's an area where it loses pressure, but because the wall of the shell is so thin, it's not that much of a difference between this and the actual bore diameter. And they usually make this a little longer. In older guns, they would have a forcing cone, if you wanted to call it that, that was about a quarter inch. It would just meant that they made sure this wasn't a completely square edge. That also meant that if this thing was an overlong shell, it would have half a chance of getting to where it wouldn't blow up in your face. Now, most of the forcing cones are under half an inch, but some of them are over, so I'm going to say half inch forcing cone. Creates this nice, smooth edge here. And again, if your shotgun shell is very thin-walled, this works fine because there's not much of a difference between what the wad's base is, which is plastic, to the rest of it. Now, if you put in an old fiber wad-based old uh, paper hole with thick walls, you end up with the exact opposite problem. It's over bore, just for about an inch or so, half an inch, and you get it spilling through. You need to stack up your wad column taller so you can tolerate this gap. In fact, many people stack up a wad column that's really tall so that it'll bridge this area and keep the pressure from getting loose. It should also be pointed out that instead of black powder, we're using much more fast burning sometimes. Um, modern smokeless powder, which may burn up entirely into a gas before it gets out of the shell. And again, by just using the number of five thousandths of an inch every inch of depth for chamber diameter change, you end up with a shell, uh, you see me, you end up with a chamber that's three inches almost. But anyway, the paper hole uh, inner diameter fiber wad gas seal doesn't work anymore. It's under bore for the diameter, you get blow by, and uh, it's over a longer distance. So that's why if you have a modern gun with a, t with a longer forcing cone, sometimes you're better off, you know, only using modern ammo. And you can also use fiber wads in these. You just have to use oversized ones that fit, and they'll work too. Now, this is not based on experience, expertise, or anything. It's just me observing something interesting about this, that basically get cartridges that work for the gun you got. Older guns weren't made to the standard of tolerating very high pressure spikes. And again, if you put a modern cartridge in an older gun, you're creating two pressure spikes. One of them is the ammunition having higher burning rate for the powder, and also because of this almost obstruction rather than obturation of the wad and shot column. Maybe it will damage the gun. Now I'm going to point out a few things. If you did the five thousandths of an inch taper per inch for chamber depth, you get the shot shell length like I talked about. But what if you extended it, making the chamber keep tapering down until it reaches the bore diameter that's supposed to be 729. 0.729. That means you'd end up with a barrel that would be, if you did a, if it was just cylinder bore at the muzzle, it would be 16.6 .6 inches long. Just a little over an inch and a half too short, about an inch and a half too short, for it to be legal minimum length for a shotgun. Yeah, kind of funny. Clink and ink. Now, if you made it a full choke taper, not even multi-bore, but just a tapered piece of pipe, it would end up being 23.8 inches long. Plenty enough for a standard gun. A little bit short if I wanted to make a gun I wanted to do for long range. Would this work? It would work only 
with modern shells with thin walls and only if you made sure that you used fast burning powder or would it? I don't know. I want to do that experiment. But I wanted to point out something. Doing a modern barrel this way or even this weird thing I talked about where it's just one long choke or one long forcing cone choke combo, you could make a barrel very easily by heating up, let's say, a metal, metal tubing, you know, good quality stuff, get it red hot, and then squeeze it around a mandrel, and the mandrel halves from, from on the outside and the inside would easily let go by just twisting them against each other to where you get the barrel off. And it would be a lot easier than milling a chamber and milling the barrel and all of this stuff. And that is how some barrels are done. That's how you hammer forge a barrel with rifling in it. This could also be done for a shotgun for making the barrels. Coincidentally, that's how some of them are built. But I don't know if they've ever done this because it would eliminate most of what people think about it being difficult or expensive to do. Last thing, I, uh, this video originally started off with a list of primer diameters because I noticed something funny. If you wanted to make the world's smallest pistol cartridge, you'd start off with a cap gun cartridge, a cap gun uh, uh, you know, cap, because it's basically six caliber. The next one is 16 and a half, being a percussion cap, and it's 15.8 minimum. And then you end up with small pistol or rifle primers being about the size of a pellet gun pellet at 17 point something caliber. And for large rifle and pistol primers, you end up with a 21 caliber diameter. And then for shotgun inner primer, it's called 209 for that reason, it's 0.209 inches. And it's actually 0.24 inches, 24 caliber like, to make it to where it'll fit into a hole. You have to have that size drill bit. 50 BMG primers are 8 millimeter or 31.5 caliber, if you want to call it that. But the one I thought that was funny is when I tried to look up musket caps or um, percussion caps. They only give the inner diameter. They don't give the outer because for them, it's not how it chambers. It goes over something. Just thought it was interesting. But yeah, I was trying to figure out how would you make the world's smallest uh, pistol cartridge? You'd start off with a cap gun. Kind of funny. Anyway, thanks for watching. Have a good day. Good luck with that. And I know that this isn't perfect. I know it has defects, but I'm trying to learn this stuff and I'm trying to share what I've learned. But as far as I can tell, this is absolutely accurate. Please correct me below. Good day.